escape. This thing? Oh, yes. Um, well, thank you for inviting me and to have the chance to speak to a bit of a larger audience. I, I thought 9 o'clock nobody would be there, but uh, I see there's quite a bit of people who took the, the effort. Um, looking at the program and knowing some of my colleagues, what they did here, there's been quite a bit of um, talk about the comments and how it relates to degrowth. Um, and there's been talk about open hardware in a, in a few uh, workshops. Um, but I want to basically um, talk a, a little bit about more the, the role of the digital commons, more specifically um, into any transition towards degrowth, commons-based uh, society. Um, so as an example, um, I took this project, uh, which is called the Newton Dance Project, to kind of talk a, talk a bit around it and show you some of the characteristics of what we call uh, commons-based peer production and why this is uh, an important factor uh, in degrowth strategies. Um, so as you see, if you can see the screen, this is a global community of farmers, citizen scientists and academic uh, agricultural engineers who have a really crazy idea that if you put good nutrients in the soil, you get better food. Uh, in other words, the opposite of uh, toxic industrial agriculture. And as you can imagine, there are no subsidies for this kind of research, or very, very little. So what do you do when you have a very important thing to do and uh, you're not supported uh, by the state or, uh, to do this kind of research, and certainly not by Monsanto, well, what you have to do is mutualize your efforts, right? And this is exactly what they're doing. So um, imagine that you have uh, an alpine environment in Ecuador with steep land, a uh, certain bioclimate zone, and you have the same zone in Bhutan, then what you would do is you would agree on a research protocol, uh, do the experiments in both places and share the knowledge and actually build a knowledge commons together about how to improve the productivity of your land. That knowledge is fully shareable. Now, what's interesting is to look at this from a kind of post-capitalist point of view, to look at how this way of creating value escapes the labor capital form and escapes the commodity form, right? For example, the core of the value creation in this project is not labor. It's not wage labor that is paid and commanded to do this project. We're talking about the community of contributors. This community of contributors is not producing commodities, they're producing shareable, non-rival and even anti-rival knowledge goods. So this is not the production of capital. This is the production of commons. Open input, participatory process, which goes together, because if you're, as a community, aggregating without a command structure, uh, you're not going to uh, obey uh, commands from somebody who is, you know, you don't have a dependency situation with. So the participatory process and the commons-oriented output, because if you want to volunteer and contribute to this project, you don't want it to be privatized. Why would you do it if it's going to be privatized and benefit only one particular company afterwards? So, as you see, all these things goes to, go together. Now, of course, this is only kind of one side of the, of the question, right? Most of these people, whether they're scientists or farmers, have to make a living. Very likely, the scientists will be paid by some university public funding, maybe, maybe in some cases private funding. The farmers, I would guess, 99% of the case, working for the marketplace, right? But it's also important to know that they don't have to work necessarily fully in the capitalist marketplace, right? They could very well become cooperatives. Uh, they could very well become part of the solidarity economy, right? So these commons that we, are, that we see here at the core of the value creation 
um, can be subsumed to a system of capital, like most of open source software is today, and a lot of open hardware is. They have a commons, shared knowledge base, but the economy around it is a capitalist economy. Or you could embed it into a new type of structure. And this is a kind of invitation to think about this as a terrain of struggle, as a terrain of tension, where you do have choices to use what I would call the hyper-productivity of this mode of production for the benefit of a new type of an economy. Um, so let me say a few things about how, how does this relate to degrowth. Now I like to... Just no. I use this as an object to explain something. So this is a, a capitalist object, a commodity, right? Uh, what can we say about this, apart that it's drinkable? Um, well, Margaret Kennedy, in the 80s, a German monetary theorist, said that, um, was it 45%? That I think it was, no, 45 or 55% of the cost of this glass of water is debt, right? So debt-based money creation, you know, which doubles in 20, 30, 40 years, uh, forces people to lend money, to pay back double, and, inf and therefore to grow, and all these costs have to be integrated in the price of this class. The second thing, and I forgot my notebook, so I can't remember the details, it's on my desk in my room, uh, but there was a study about three, four months ago that uh, calculated that if you look at the cost of production in materials and energy, Amazingly, three quarters of the cost in our globalized economy is transport. It's not production. It's getting it from here to there. It's getting uh, milk from Germany to Patagonia, where they have the best butter in the world, but it's not competitive, so they buy uh, German uh, mm. milk. Or where, where I live in Chiang Mai, we, we, it's a very productive agricultural region. But they actually send the food from China, they pass Chiang Mai, they go to Bangkok, and then they send it back to Chiang Mai. This is the reality of our globalized uh, capitalist economy. So this is the second aspect that is interesting. And the third, of course, is IP rent, right? All the IP rent, probably not a lot in the case of a glass of water. But generally speaking, it's a huge part of our economy that goes to IP rent to protect to, to the, the intellectual property protections, right? So this is why if you move the production to an open form without intellectual property, the first effect will be that generically speaking, there have been several studies of this, the cost of production goes down to one-eighth. So if you change from scientific laboratories using proprietary scientific instruments to a scientific laboratory based on open scientific instruments for the same quality, you can do so for one eighth of the price. So you can do two things, save money, or you can expand it to eight times more students and users. Uh, the second aspect is if you combine this open knowledge with distributed manufacturing, with 3D printing, you can start producing locally and, there, and therefore you can uh, produce without the three quarters of cost that are um, part of the transport uh, aspect. Uh, thirdly, you could have a system of debt-free money creation, a mutual credit system or anything that's similar to that, where you eliminate the debt issue, right? So you can see that if you do this intelligent, intelligently, there is an enormous potential there to create a new type of economy that combines global open design commons with open and distributed local manufacturing of the goods needed by the people at the local level. So it's not pure localization, it's rather, I would say, the very simple rule would be if it's light, it's global, if it's heavy, it's local, right? So the material production, you move it to micro factories close by, but what you want to do is mutualize the knowledge 
at the global level and have the farmers in Bhutan work with wherever the knowledge uh, may, may, may be and mutually enrich each other. Um, now there is one more important and I think vital argument which is the following. If you put innovation, science and research in the private sphere of for-profit companies, how do you design? You design for scarcity, you design for the marketplace, right? So planned obsolescence, it's not a bug, it's a feature. There is not, probably not a single product today that is not designed to break down, right? Now, compare the potential, for example, of a car. It's one of the 26 open source car projects. When I say car, don't think car, think, think pickup truck, think tractor, think, you know, they're modular systems, you can do different things with them. Uh, think about the Wikispeed car, which is five times the fuel efficient as any car in Detroit. Why is Detroit not producing these cars? They can. They don't want to, right? Because they have legacy systems, they have investments, they have profit motives, and most of the innovation that's done inside these companies, like here in Germany, Volkswagen, are just shelved. They're not being used at all because they, they don't fit with the growth strategy, the for-profit strategy. What if you are a community? What if you design a product on the basis of need for on-demand production, not supply-driven, not mass-marketing-driven, need-driven local production on-demand in a micro-factory? If you design for this kind of uh, environment, you're going to make a sustainable design. You're going to make a, a modular design. You're going to look at biodegradable mat materials. You don't have to be a saint or an, or an environmentalist to do that. It just goes with the territory. Now, of course, I'm not saying this is automatic or this is enough. I would say, you know, necessary but not sufficient, right? We can imagine another scenario, and this would be a capitalist scenario, where in Walmart or Woolworth or whatever, what you use here in Germany, you could buy a $200 3D printer and start making toys with non-degradable plastic, and it would just be another part of the consumption economy, right? So it's not the technology that's kind of magically uh, responsible for this. It's a particular techno-social logic, right? It's, it's a mode of production, it's a mode of relations that is different and that leads to that outcome. And of course, uh, and this is a bit of a contradiction, okay, this is a particular I would say eco-friendly uh, group, but most people engaged in peer production are not green, they're not degrowth, they are hackers, uh, you know, free software communities, free culture communities, they're not necessarily politically, ecologically conscious. But again, terrain of struggle. Imagine if you guys here would engage with these communities, would create green fab labs, open sustainable fab labs, would engage would make those green fab labs in the eco villages, right? At that, at that point, you, what you do is you, you fully synergize, if you like, the p potential that's there with green practice, green consciousness, and degrowth aims, right? So these things go together. Now, let's go back to the relation of this to capitalism. Okay, here's the situation. I am a commoner, I am a peer producer, I contribute to a commons. How do I make a living? Well, most of the time, I have to find a job as labor for capital, right? So I produce Linux, open source software, but in order to make a living, I need to work for IBM and the commercial open software economy, which is 70% of the Linux economy. So in other words, what happens is that we have a proto mode of production. It's not a full mode of production because at this stage it cannot fully self-reproduce itself, right? Food, shelter, these things are not embedded in the system that you see here. So what, what can we do about this? Well, here's the thing. As we can see in many countries in Europe, any strategy that's based on labor and the strength of labor and the achievements of labor 
universal suffrage, the welfare state. It's disappearing because labor is disappearing, right? We are fast moving to a deproletarized economy where one out of three, one of the three people in the US are already freelancing. They're no more in the labor condition. They are craftsmen, if you like. And it will be one out of two in 2020. In Europe, we have one out of four and it's moving to one out of three in 2020. And it's these knowledge networked network knowledge workers that form the social basis of these peer-to-peer -peer and digital commons. Because if you don't work together in physical you need to network. You need to find ways of collaboration. You need to share knowledge in a networked environment. Um, so here is something particular that is happening today. And I say it somewhat provocatively, and not everyone is happy when I say this. But here's the thing, so the open source communities use open licenses, like the general public license, creative commons, etc. So here's the rule. The more communistic the license, the more capitalistic the practice, right? It's, it's a contradiction, but this is what happens. Because everybody can share the knowledge, IBM can use Linux. Uh, so what we are proposing is something called a commons-based reciprocity license, one of which already exists called the peer production license. And we slightly tweak the rules. What we say is the following. Every common good institution can use our commons. It can be used for every non-profit activity. It can even be used by for-profits if they contribute to the commons. But, what, but those for-profits who do not contribute have to pay the license fee. The idea here is not the money, which of course is always welcome, uh, but the key idea is to reintroduce reciprocity in the marketplace. In other words, to f consider this license as a social charter which requires reciprocity in order to cooperate with your commons. And then, and that's what people, f they freak out, you know, they say, oh, but you know, what's, what's reciprocity? Well, that's exactly the point. You need to organize and discuss to determine what is reciprocity for your particular entrepreneurial coalition that works around that particular commons. And this is the whole point, because in the capitalist society, social and environmental externalities are banned out of the market equation. But we can have like the solidarity economy, where these equations are part of the social charter of the participating members. So one of the good news is that we had a talk, and we were going to work together on this license with the solidarity economy um, coalitions. Next step that we propose is the notion of open corporativism. So what does that mean? Well, corps are nice. They practice economic democracy, but in many cases they're also selfish. They work within the capitalist competition dynamics. Uh, and then you have things like Mondragon going to Poland, don't want the Polish workers to be cooperators because that affects their bonuses. And so they hire them at the minimum wage and they have a strike against Mondragon, the cooperative in Poland. That was two, three years ago, right? So here is a tweak. An open cooperative is a cooperative that is common good oriented. So in other words, within its statutes, internal statutes and regulations, it has a common good orientation, not a for-profit orientation. It's multi-stakeholder, so it's not just for the workers, everybody affected by your activity has a say in, in the governance. Third, and this is new, because the two first already exist, they're called solidarity cooperatives, and 98% of the new co-ops in Quebec are solidarity co-ops, so we're good. It's, you know, we're moving in that direction. Same in the northern of Italy. But what needs to happen is a third factor, which is co-production of the commons, right? This can be digital commons, so using open licenses, not closed license. This can be producing physical commons. The Alianza Solidaria in Quito is reclaiming the ravines of South Quito and making them into public resources because they're dumps right now. They're cleaning them up, putting parks, and sharing that with, with the communities. This is a civic commons. But we could also imagine machine commons, right? Our production, our productive capital could be conceived as a commons. And there are ways to do that. Land, community land trust, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the third requirement. The fourth would be 
um, uh, global orientation. This is a bit, again, a field of tension between the localists and the alter globalists. And so the idea is, even though that we, we can uh, produce locally, I believe we need to organize globally, right? We need to reconstruct economic and social power for this counter economy. So what labor did in the 19th century, and it was this win gradually lost because labor is dissolving in front of our eyes, we need to reconstruct social economic power around the commons. And I think we can do this around politics as well. I made a, I'm not good at math, but I made a little calculation that if we can unite digital commoners, think about the pirate parties, the platform parties, if we can unite the Greens, if we can unite the new transformative left parties, like Podemos and Syriza, for example, and I would argue actually progressive social liberals because they represent a new progressive entrepreneurs, we have a social majority around the commons, potentially coalitions in Europe that are aligned around the commons and can f f uh, find a counterweight against the, the rise of the radical right, right? Because as we know, the radical right has socialist policies and our socialist parties have neoliberal policies. So we have a problem here, right? Um, okay, so it's not a very beautiful slide, but it will do. Um, so maybe this is kind of like class struggle 3.0, if, if you want to call it that way. Um, so here's the thesis. We are moving whether, and I know this sounds a bit techno-determinist, but I think this is really the case. We are moving largely towards peer-to-peer -to -peer systems, network systems in every domain of social life. But there are huge issues of ownership and control. So this helps you have a, have a kind of a vision of what's happening in that sphere. As we move to peer-to-peer -peer systems, to commoning, to commons, to digital commons, even within the capitalist sphere, we get some tension. So the first, the vertical axis is centralized versus distributed, and the um, horizontal axis is for profit versus for benefit oriented. So here's the weird thing. Can you have centralized for-profit peer-to-peer systems? Sounds a bit contradictory, but Facebook. Facebook massively enables and empowers two billion people to engage in permissionless horizontal communication and self-organization. It's just a fact. We may like Facebook or not, but at the front end, that's exactly what they do. But what about the back end? Do you have control on the design of Facebook? Do you have a say in the governance of Facebook? Do you capture the value that's created by the users of Facebook? No, right? So it's a centralized technology owned by for-profit shareholders who determine and, and nudge and steer your behavior. And they capture 100% of the value that is being created by the users community. So think about a system of capitalism where 100% of the value is captured by capital and 0% of the value is shared with those who create the value. Is that sustainable? I don't think so. So this is a form of you know, cognitive feudalism, if you like. Right? This is a return to kind of a feudal scenario. Another solution is let's distribute the structures, but still with a for-profit orientation. And this is, you know, the program from our good friends in the anarcho-capitalist community uh, with Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is designed with a deflationary design, so the value goes up, the, the, the supply grows slower than the demand by design. And so the whole dynamic of Bitcoin is around profit, profiting from the Bitcoins that you have, right? So we have here a money which is formally peer-to-peer -peer in its production because every computer, in theory, can produce the bitcoins. But in fact, because it's more and more expensive to do so, we have a monopoly in mining. The Gini coefficient of bitcoin is higher than, than what they call fiat currency. 
And so Bitcoin is really a very unequal money, but the philosophy, if you like, is peer-to-peer -peer in the sense that everybody can be a trader, right? That's, that's the, the philosophy there. But I think it's important to see that there is a political design in Bitcoin. And this is the point I want to make, right? When we are in network, it's not obvious who is the us and the them, because you have a networked graph around you. But if you look at the infrastructures that make it possible, the design, the architecture, that's where the struggle happens. That's what determines how the network field operates. So here's, and of course I put that on the left, which is a bit strange, but you have to imagine this as a, a, time, a time thing, right? So we're moving away, we want to move away from the dominant form, which is controlled by capital, to a form of commons-based peer production that is subsumed under a commons and a commoner uh, paradigm. So here we have two different um, polarities as well. I would call it local orientation and for benefit orientation versus global orientation and for benefit orientation. So the first thing we have on the bottom right is the extraordinary revival of local resilient initiatives. And don't think, they have any, don't think they're not related to technology, they are. The ability to create local currencies, to do new supply chains for local food, has been extraordinarily facilitated by network technology. And for example, in the US, again, I, I left my notes on my table, there was a 48% growth of urban food production, largely peer-to-peer -peer driven in just two years. Right? So there is a revolution going on, if you like, bottom-up, grassroots, around reorganizing supply chains, reorganizing local monetary systems through networks, but not always with a global vision. Okay, I may be wrong here, but when I look at the transition town movement, yes, they are globally organized. Yes, they share, but they share to do local. Right? I don't see necessarily a vision that also has a global component in terms of strategy. And I think we need it. So this is why we, I believe we also should move to the bottom, to the top right in this case, which is a global orientation and a for benefit orientation combined. So how could this work? Well, imagine, I'll take the wiki speed uh, as an example. So what do we have? We have a global open design commons that already exists. Engineers from the whole world are designing collectively this car. It's an amazing project. Three months, 80 people in 12 countries design a car that's five times as fuel efficient as an industrial car that can be made in eight hours in a local market factory. And they can make trucks and pickups and tractors just by you know, adapting the design. It's kind of a legal system, right? So that global open design community already exists. Um, then we have, and that doesn't really exist yet, uh, maybe just on an experimental basis in that case, but then we have the micro factories. These are the local people who want to make transport items for their community in their rural fab lab or rural hacker space using these designs. What is missing and this is something that uh, another group called Lazinias has called a file or a file from the Greek word of clan. And we're all inspired by our Bible in the P2P movement. It's a science fiction book called The Diamond Age from Neil Stephenson. So that's where we get all our inspiration from. Um, is the notion of global business ecosystems that sustain commons and their communities. So the owners. The, the polarity here is not on the business, it's on the community. And for example, at the P2P Foundation, we have the same problem, right? We, we pre-produce knowledge about peer production. And we've done largely as volunteers. Well, you can volunteer all the time, right? You, you have to eat. So how do we sustain our work? But the thing that's important here is that our economic activities have to support our commons, otherwise there is no point to it, right? So this is the new, the new logic 
that the file, the file, if you like, is a global ecosystem that supports a particular commons to sustain it, to grow it, and to create livelihoods for the people involved in the creation of the commons. Okay, um, I have five minutes. So let's make a little historical uh, conclusion. So imagine we live at the end of the Roman Empire. Um, and at some point, the cost of expansion is bigger than the benefits of expansion. So the empire stops growing. No more slaves. And you can't breed slaves. It's not economical. Uh, no more gold because they come, come from the outside. So what do you do? There's less and less money to buy the legions. There's less and less money to buy the overseers in the domains of the slave owners. The slaves are fleeing. The Germans, the Germanic tribes, when they're in front of a German city, they, they, they tell the slaves they will be free if they win. So all the slaves escape from the cities whenever a Germanic tribe appears. So they're facing all these problems. So what you have here is an exodus of the slaves from the slavery system towards what would eventually become the serf-based system. And you have a reorientation of the slave owners who think, well, maybe I should free my slaves, keep 50% instead of 100%, but then I don't need my soldiers, you know, I don't need so many soldiers to repress uh, the slaves, right? Um, the other thing that happened is, what do you do when you have a resource crisis, which is what happened in Rome? Well, you do two things. You mutualize knowledge. So the monks, right? The monks were the global open design community. They were the engineers of the time, and they share knowledge, and they create a European civilization based on the sharing of their knowledge. You mutualize your living uh, arrangements. The monasteries. Very light footprint, but everybody had shelter and food and a very rich spiritual life. Uh, so look at today, what's happening today. We have a resource crisis. We have an exodus, right? Labor is bleeding out and is becoming freelance, crafts-based, commoning-oriented knowledge work in, in many cases. But it, even service workers and production workers have more and more these aspects in, in their life. So we have an exodus and we have a reorientation of the smarter parts of, the, of capital towards the autarchical capital, the Googles, the Amazons, the Ebays uh, of our world. And who are the monks today? Well, they are the people, for example, in the Catalan Integral Cooperative. Uh, if you go there, you join them, 2,000 people, the first thing they tell you is what you need to live and to realize the project, and from now on you don't have to worry because we'll make sure you have the basics. And they're degrowth oriented, and everything they do is open source, right? So they're, they're an open cooperative producing commons, and they're degrowth oriented. So I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting everybody should go there, uh, but I think uh, most of us should be thinking of moving partially in some of these directions uh, because this is going to be an absolutely necessary part of the transition towards degrowth. Thank you so much.